Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Dandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. I am a little sick and in quarantine because I am COVID positive at the moment. So that's why my video is not on. Uh, today, the topic for today's webinar is, is there such a thing as a sustainable consumer? And we have uh, Sarah Ottaway from uh, Suez Recycling and Recovery UK, who's a moderator for today's webinar. If you haven't watched other webinars she's moderated on Be Waste Wise, please go to the video panel section and uh, you will find it listed over there. A uh, video panel section of our website and you'll find it there. Sarah is going to talk to another Be Waste Wise moderator, Emma Burlow, who's a founder at uh, Lighthouse Sustainability. We also have Jen Gale, who's a founder at Sustainable-ish, and uh, Stephen Bates, who's a behavior change and communications expert. As always, uh, we will be taking audience questions, so please use the Q&A section. Uh, I think Sarah's plan to a lot, a lot of time to what the audience have to ask our panelists. So please use the Q&A section and um, over to you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Sweta, and thank you so much for still uh, joining in, even though you are <laughs> you're under the weather. So thank you so much. And welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining today's session, where we will be exploring that question of, is there such a thing as a sustainable consumer? Um, as someone who's been in the industry for 15 years, I think it's a question that's often come up in that time. And uh, I'm really looking forward with this fantastic panel of delving into it a little bit deeper today. So um, as I said, I am the Sustainability and Social Value Lead for Suez Recycling and Recovery UK. And and I think this uh, this topic is so exciting because it's one that those of us in the industry see as so important. But equally, we see the absolute opposite when it comes to to governments who just seem to not have this on their radars politically. And at the same time, we're seeing the influx of greenwashing from businesses that are desperately trying to sell us more things to solve a problem, but creating another one at the same time. Um, and. And the problem isn't going away. You know, there's only last week there was a report by the organization Circle Economy that showed the, the huge and scary news that actually we've consumed more than half a trillion tons of virgin materials since the Paris Agreement was, was uh, put into writing in 2015. And that pattern is increasing. It is not going the opposite way, which those of us, which is the reason um, I'm sure many of you have joined us today, know is that we've got to use less resources. We need to use the ones that we are using for much longer. And those that come to the end of their usable life, we able to put them back into something meaningful at the end of it so they get used again and again here in the uk is a great example of the fact that we are consuming uh, raw materials at the rate of three planets per person and that's not uncommon in many parts of the world uh, so we have a long way to go to find that balance but what does that mean for an individual trying to navigate the day-to-day -day and make sustainable choices and make good decisions what does consuming sustainability mean in reality you know is that the same in different parts of the world and do we do we really know what a sustainable consumer is would we know if we met one or if we were looking at one in the mirror i'm not quite sure um, so like i say to delve into that question we have assembled this incredible panel so as i said we have emma verlo who is a fellow b Waste wise moderator and also the founder of lighthouse sustainability she is one of the uk's leading specialists on the circular economy and sustainability in business having worked in the space for 25 years she's currently focusing on reuse and carbon literacy both really important and relevant topics for today as well so basically what she doesn't know about any of this isn't worth knowing so you know she's super useful from that point of view for our discussion today you also have jen gale who is the founder of sustainable ish which is a community interest company if you haven't come across it before which she created after spending a year buying nothing new so she's an expert on this topic in many ways and she's now on a mission to make sustainable living the norm by empowering progress and not eco perfection and uh, jen there's definitely no yogurt weavers here so don't worry we're all in good company <laughs> <laughs> uh, and finally is Stephen Bates, who's a behaviour change and communications expert and the founder of Mobius. Uh, he's spent 40 years in public comms and behaviour change, and it's estimated his work has positively influenced about half of the UK households. And he's taken that expertise to over 30 countries worldwide. So it's safe to say he knows his stuff when it comes to influencing positive behaviour change. <laughs> So we do have this incredible panel of experts. So if you want me to ask them a question, then do add them into the Q&A panel and also share your thoughts on this topic because I'm sure there's gonna be plenty of them in that chat function. I've got everything here and I'm gonna be spending as much of today's session as possible answering those questions and getting them uh, discussed by our panel. 
So to kick off, I'm just going to go around each of them in turn and ask them their opinions on this topic. So the question, I'm going to repose it to them just in case they've forgotten in the last two minutes while I've been talking, is, is there such a thing as sustainable consumption? And can we as individuals become or be sustainable consumers? Emma, I'm going to come to you first. What's your thoughts on, on all of this? Thanks, Sarah. You're right. It is a million dollar question. Um, I'm going to kick off and say yes. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're an animal, we're a species, we consume stuff to, to live. That's what we do. Um, that's what all species do. Um, but the things we do, the thing that we do differently is we're the only species on the planet that creates waste that can't be reused or recycled either by ourselves or by other things on the planet. So we, we, you know, we create waste where other other animals create resources that then go on to be compost or eaten by another animal or part of the food chain or whatever. So we're really unique in that. And I think we've we've created this problem all by ourselves and mainly because we've stopped consuming what we need and we've started consuming what we want. Um, so that's the big difference for me. You know, if you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we need a certain amount of stuff to stay alive. Um, and, you know, and, and, the, and the, on, it, on it goes and up the, up the sort of chain of luxury um, if you're lucky enough to get there. So, you know, I think we've lost connection entirely with what we need to consume. So, yes, we are consumers. And yes, I think if we were to regain that connection, and I think lots of people are looking to do that by being more minimalist, more aware, more conscious of what they buy, then absolutely we can. Um, consume sustainably. Um, I just think we've had 30, 40, 50 years pushing in the other direction. So um, it's a bit of a sort of ocean liner analogy in terms of turning that round. We've been educated or taught to believe that we need things to make us happy, to make us more successful, to give us status, all those sorts of things, all that just to save us time and, and all those things. So we've been um, certainly on a, on a track whereas if you go back to where I started if we if we believe that we need to consume to stay alive to stay fit and healthy to educate ourselves to have a roof over our, over our heads would we be consuming at the rate we are um that's the big question yeah that that is a big question absolutely thank you Emma uh, I'm going to move swiftly on I'm going to ask the same questions like to go like I said, I'd like to go through the whole panel, get their thoughts, and then we'll delve into your questions. I'm going to come next to Jen. Jen, what's your thoughts following on from Emma? I don't know if I'll be able to put it as succinctly or eloquently as Emma. Um, uh, yeah, I absolutely think we can consume um, sustainably. I think there's probably a lot of uh, confusion maybe about what sustainable consumption looks like. I don't know if anyone's seen it. There's a great... Um, graphic that's doing the rounds on social media from fashion revolution which has these two bar charts and like one is what uh people think sustainable fashion means and it's like spending loads of money on uh you know sustainable and ethical brands um i can't remember what the middle one was and then like wearing shapeless linen and then and then the other ones like um you know wearing what you already have repairing the things that you have looking you know and it's all and buying second hand and all this and actually you know that's um, is, you know, that needs to be recreated, not just across fashion, but across, you know, everything that we buy. And I think because we live in this very consumer society, and as Emma said, we've been trained to consume, we've been trained to consume um, more than we need. We've, you know, you sort of take a step back and you start to realise quite how manipulative um, adverts and things like that are and how, um, you know, we are sold this message that our lives will be better, we will be uh, more successful or appear more successful or will fit, you know, I'm sure Stephen will tell us about these sort of behavioural urges to, to fit in and to be one of the tribe and not to be seen to be standing out. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to um, to it's quite countercultural, I say, to sort of um, consume less or to can slow down and consume more thoughtfully, and kind of add into that the fact that we we live in this very uh, convenience-based society where convenience seems to trump everything, and we're very time poor and things like that, and we don't see the, you know, Emma talked about that disconnect. We don't see the um, the impact or the results of our. Um, it's this kind of hyper consumption, isn't it? Like there's a certain level that we all need to consume, whether that's energy or, you know, if we've got kids that are growing clothes, all those kinds of things. But we've, 
it just I think in the last 20 years fallen into this real sort of hyper consumption things and if we think back just a couple of generations to our parents in the that real make do and men generation how more mindful and resourceful they were with the things that they already had um, but that feels very unaspirational doesn't it that feels like we're taking a step back um, and the whole time we're sold this message of new shiny bigger better um, when actually you know what we actually need to be doing is going the opposite way but that's um, quite difficult to push against that when you're being bombarded with all these societal expectations but yeah I absolutely think it's possible. Fantastic. So we've got a wave of optimism so far. That's that's great. Uh, thank you, Jen. I'm going to move swiftly over to uh, to Steve. Steve, welcome. Uh, hello. Hello. Over to you. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll continue the optimism up to a point because, uh, yeah, I, absolutely. There are sustainable consumers uh, and there is such a thing as sustainable consumerism. Um, and it's something that, that I, I sense that we're moving into a, 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 the early phases of normalizing that in the UK and a lot of Western uh, nations. Uh, in the same way that if we go back 20 years ago in the UK when we started to introduce curbside recycling, for example, it wasn't normal then. There was a big fight uh, and a, a big push to get people to recycle. Everyone thought it was a myth. It all went in the same hole. But today, that doesn't exist, not certainly as much as it did then. So recycling has become normalized. And I believe firmly that, that in certainly in the UK, we are in the early stages of, of, of normalizing sustainable consumerism it, it becomes part of, of people's just day-to-day -day psyche and in behavior change the, 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 there are there's a hierarchy that I created some time ago where we sort of set out what those things are that, that, that are most effective in stimulating behavior change and the first one is is removing the option to, to, to behave contrary to requirement. So in Singapore for example they banned chewing gum because it was a problem with litter and vandalism. By banning chewing gum, they, they, they've eliminated the problem. They've directly changed behaviours or influenced behaviours. So and it's all about moving people through that, that, that chain to normalisation. And I believe that we're in the early stages of, of that sort of becoming this groundswell of desire. The however is that this is a, a very much a regional thing. Uh, in a single country, you will find the sum of society that fully embrace sustainability and use that to, to shape their, their consuming habits. Uh, but also in the same country, you will find people often at the lower end of uh, society, the economic um, prosperity, where they're, they're nowhere near to that. They're more concerned about where the next tin of baked beans is coming from, rather than what the tin is made from and what they do with it once they've consumed the contents. And then we look when we look globally, particularly at middle income countries, they're emerging from from all manner of problems. Uh, they want to embrace consumerism because that's a way that's a that's a way their economies can grow. And we have to question, are they really motivated uh, to, to embrace sustainability as they made that transition? Uh, or can we see that as an opportunity? Their canvas has yet to be drawn on. And so I think we have an opportunity as well as a challenge in those regions to sort of shape how they embrace consumerism going forward. So, uh, yeah, that's my, my starter for 10. Thanks, Steve. And you come on to a really interesting question, which we've already got questions coming in from the audience on, which is around cost. Um, so obviously cost is um, uh, often perceived as a, as a barrier when it comes to making making more sustainable choices, food being an obvious one, um, you know, for example, choosing more perhaps organic or locally sourced uh, product, particularly in the West, can be seen as more, you know, uh, more expensive. Is, is, that a, is that a barrier? Is that more a barrier in particular, um, in particular countries, for example, um, from, from your point of view, from your experience? Yeah, it's an issue in, in the West. It's an issue in the UK. Um, a literally a two-minute walk from where I live is the best farm shop. You, you'll ever find it's, it was set up and run by the former uh, gross head of grocery at Harrods. So he quite literally knows his onions, and he just he produces he sells the most wonderful food, and it's all organic. It's all loose. If you want to buy a carrier bag, he will sell you one for two pounds. Uh, the money goes to charity, and it's a wonderful uh, resource. It's a great way to buy your produce in a, in a very sustainable way. It's all sustainably sourced, and so on. Um, but 
a, a bag of spuds, potatoes, will cost you three times as much as the supermarket, which is 10 minute drive away. And those spuds from the supermarket will almost always come in a pre-packaged packaged plastic bag. And so there is this huge disparity in day-to-day -day products where if you want to make a sustainable choice, that's gonna come at the cost premium. And I think to generate true meaningful sustainability in retail particularly, that, that, that cost differential has to, to, to be rebalanced somehow. Thanks, Steve. Can I just, Jen. I was, I was going to say, I think food is um, almost quite different, is it? That, 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 you know, organic does cost more and there are lots of reasons behind that and things. Um, and you can't really buy, you know, secondhand food and stuff like that. But when it comes to actually sustainable consumption of, um, you know, I don't know, tech, clothes, things like that, th this is where it, I think it becomes difficult because obviously, um, we live in this very consumer based society. So if we want a sustainable, if we want to be sustainable, the first thing we do is look around and go, what do I, what do I need to buy in order to be more sustainable? And obviously the answer to that is nothing. You know, the most sustainable version of anything is the one you've already got, but that's not a message that we're hearing. And that's not a message that helps retailers, you know, fulfill their bottom line in terms of uh, financial profits and things like that. So that's, I think where, you know this this idea of what is sustainable consuming needs kind of unpacking maybe for people that it isn't you know the latest um reusable coffee cup or you know the the nice um luxury ethical sustainable clothing brands it's probably the stuff you've already got but i completely get that that's dull and unaspirational and um not a marketing message that you can particularly sell <laughs> But it's a good point, though, and I think it also comes on to another question that we've had in from the audience, Jeb, uh, which Emma, I'll come to you on this one and bring bring you into this too. Um, obviously, uh, that that's exactly obviously a really common message that goes out is about buying less when we're talking about the sustainable consumption space. But what how do we do that in an equitable way? So obviously there are some communities, some obviously you know lower income countries where this isn't uh, you know. Uh, the buying less isn't necessarily there at the forefront of their mind and they're obviously thinking about as Stephen was saying putting food on the table putting clothes on keeping clothes on their kids how do we balance that message for those communities what, what does sustainable consumption mean to them those communities are already sustainably you know consuming sustainably compared to the rest of us so they're not the big consumers you know because they are worried about putting food on the table and so that you know, so their spend, you know, their average spend will, it will be drastically lower than than other people's. So when you look at carbon footprints, for example, they're entirely proportional to income. You know that the, 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 there's no two ways about it. The more you earn, you know, with a few exceptions, obviously, generally the higher your footprint because you can afford more stuff. You live in a bigger house. You might have two cars. You might go on holiday more, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think it's a real, um, it's a real, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a misnomer, you know, it doesn't, you know, people often say, oh, these families have got loads of children and look, they've got the latest gadgets and all that sort of stuff. But over the year and certainly over a generation, they won't consume nearly as much stuff. They can't possibly because they haven't got the money to spend on it. So if you think about it, it's quite obvious. So the more you spend, the more you consume generally, unless you're spending it on all of it on um, you know experiences but even if you're even if you're consuming theatre tickets or whatever you're still you know generating a carbon footprint and it's it's really clear when you look at things like flights that you know the highest proportion of flights are taken by a very small percentage of people so I know I'm, I've sort of flipped into carbon here but it's it's pretty much sort of parallel in terms of the amount of stuff that you need to consume if you want that, you know, you want that sort of lifestyle. So I, I personally, I don't worry so much about, about that being a problem because I think those people who, you know, generally are more um, thoughtful about how they spend their money um, and generally waste less anyway. So I don't know, you know, the interesting thing what Jen thinks because she, she interacts a lot more with the general public than me. But I certainly know from my own family, you know, my my grandparents, and I know they were from that era, they just didn't waste anything, but they didn't have the money to waste. Anything. So, you know, we're in a completely different um, era now where we can afford to be wasteful. 
and that is you know seen as a benefit because we've got great living conditions and all the rest of it but it's a sort of made a rod for our own backs really in that we can afford to buy whatever we like without really thinking about it interesting point jen did you want to come back in because yeah i was just gonna say i was i was asked i can't remember if it was towards the end of last year to go on um you and yours on radio four to they've got sort of families that they're following who are you know really um I don't know what the criteria was, but they're low income families. And, and it was like, so how do, what, what advice have you got for these people living on very low incomes to be more sustainable? And I kind of wanted to say what Emma said, that, you know, your footprint is probably already so low that this isn't your, the people that we need to be addressing around these issues are the, um, you know, middle high and certainly high and uber high income people. And that, you know, me telling you, oh, don't waste your food and you looking at me like, I can't afford to waste food, do you know, um, me telling you to buy your clothes secondhand, well, I already get all the clothes secondhand and we get the kids uniform secondhand, you know, you're already by necessity doing a lot of these things that reduce your consumption and, um, you know, reduce your waste. So those, that's not the, the people that these messages are targeting. And I don't know how you kind of make that clear in the messaging, but do, do you know, I, I feel like there shouldn't be any, um, guilt you know if you're if you are genuinely being really resourceful with your the, the money that you have and the resources that you have then this isn't it isn't you that we're talking to it's those people who are um able to consume slightly less thoughtfully that we need to try and um get through to there's a, another aspect sarah if i can just uh add to, to those comments as well when looking at the, the middle particularly the middle income countries um, th th those are these are the nations that are in transition that they that, that they're going places um, and the populations in those countries want to become consumers they want to be able to uh, to buy frivolous things as, as we do in, in, in the West and it's important that we embrace uh, sustainable consumption uh, in, in the UK, in the US and the EU, because what we have to do is to encourage those nations to adopt sustainable practices. And we cannot do that effectively if we ourselves are ignoring the need to do so. So it's as much about demonstrating to the world that it is possible to embrace consumerism and, and the benefits that that offers at an economic and at a social level sometimes. Um, but we, we have to demonstrate that, that we're doing that. We can't uh, take this message to the rest of the world on a do as we say, not as we do basis. Yeah, that's a really good point, Steve. And I think, um, uh, I think there's some really interesting questions that are coming in to follow on from that as well. So we're coming back to that convenience side. So um, obviously, Jen, you mentioned convenience in yours about how that's often the uh, you know quite a stimulus for the, these kind of wasteful uh, activities and behaviours that we're doing because convenience is just becoming you know becomes more and more part of busier lives that often come with um, you know a developing nation. So you know, Jen, in terms of convenience, can convenience and sustainability come hand in hand? Is that part of the message? Or actually, do we need to step away from convenience? Is that part of the problem here? Potential. I mean, I know when we did our um, our original year buying, I think, you know, I mean, this was 10 years ago, and this was, I want to say that was kind of pre, certainly before Amazon became as big as it, you know, and as kind of go-to as it is now. Um, and and I think, it. So so whether you, because it's there, there's that safety net of convenience of Amazon. Maybe we don't, plan ahead as much you know I had lots of people say oh I got caught out by my kids friend's birthday party or you know suddenly this came and I needed that or that broke and and, and I guess because it's there we use it and that's you know Am that's why Amazon is so popular and so successful is because of that convenience we don't even need to think and and I think that's where we start to to do this more mindless and that sounds really mean and it's not meant to but that that less thoughtful consumption and the, the the beauty i found in that year buying nothing new is because we had to find the things we wanted secondhand it provided that breathing space and that stop gap that you know instead of just being i don't know doing the supermarket shop and think, oh there's a t-shirt there with a dinosaur on that i know the kids would like and chucking it in the in the trolley you know it's like oh well i don't actually need a t-shirt so i won't get one or actually you know and, and it's so um, because it's so easy, because, you know, relatively speaking, stuff is cheaper than it ever has been. There's lots of the barriers that would stop us aren't there anymore. Um, so 
I think it is about slowing down and that probably doesn't come with convenience but that hooks into as well as this sort of you know epidemic of busy this idea that we we have to be busy all the time and we've got to be on the go the whole time and we're all so time poor and we've all sort of bought into that and this sounds really um worthy and sort of idealistic but you know maybe there is this whole thing about sort of slowing down and if we're consuming less then we can afford to be maybe less busy and all those sorts of things but again it's very very countercultural very very true um yeah I think that opens up a whole different area I'm going to switch ever so slightly Jen I'm going to come back to that because I'm conscious we're getting a lot of questions about business models as well so Emma I'm going to come to you this on this one being the sustainable business person that you are um so how do, how do business models fit in all this because as, as Jen was saying you know Amazon the rise of Amazon and equivalents obviously other brands are available um uh, you know, has been because of this this you know need for convenience this time poor um kind of lifestyles that are rapidly evolving how are business models keeping or what future is there for business models that could align with more sustainable consumption and move us away from that take make dispose yeah great great question um i mean business models have been around since year dot right so then yeah there's nothing sustainable about business models per se but it's the application of them in a sustainable way you know, that creates things like circular business models, which, you know, which are becoming way, way more, more acceptable and more, you know, and more adopted, um, which is great. But it's really interesting because, you know, a couple of the, the word, you know, the words we use, you know, that convenience is expected, that convenience is necessary and all these sorts of things. And, you know, I go back to my point and without making it sound like this has all been a massive conspiracy, this is kind of how we design, you know, this is how marketing has designed consumption and consumerism. So the fact that it's so easy to get stuff breaks down that barrier, that, that, that sort of friction that would cause you not to check out and not to buy something. So it's, you know, it's, it's I think Jen mentioned it right at the beginning, it's, it's very cleverly um, designed um, to make it all seamless, you know, so if I had to go to the shops, I live rurally, I'd hardly ever buy anything, you know, but as it is, I can get everything I need on the internet. Um, so I might be like, you know, a previous generation where I'd go to the shops weekly, you know. Um, so making it easier for everybody, as re like I say, it's reduced that friction and it's just made it more and more easy, you know, to consume. So, so that's a business model in itself. What, where we're going with circular business models is really interesting because they are being adopted at a rate of knots and particularly things like rent, hire and leasing. Um, ironically, just make things even more accessible for people. You know, so you can have literally whatever you want. You don't have to pay £400 for it. You can just pay 40 quid for it and hire it. So is that a more su sustainable model or is that just an accessibility model? So you see that in the car market, you know, majority of cars are now leased, not owned. So when someone's got a great big car sat on the drive, you think, wow, you know, where'd they get, you know, how'd they afford that? But they've, you know, they've leased it. So, um, so there's a real sort of, you know, a, a bit of a mismatch sometimes between the model, which could be great if applied in a circular way, and just, just actually, it just helps us consume. So um, I think where we are making some progress is around things like refurbishment, remanufacture and repair which are actually the hardest ones to, to make viable because the labour costs are so high, certainly in the Western world. Um, but we're seeing some really nice models there where people are now paying for the service, not the product. So if we can kind of, um, you know, if we can stop consuming stuff and move to consuming more services, that gives the opportunity for the back end, you know, the, the business. So Amazon would own all those products and just sell you the service of them and take them back and deal with them. So that's where I hope that, you know, circular business models really take us much toward, more towards uh, services rather than just accessing more stuff more cheaply. Can I just uh, add to that as well? Something that uh, I only found out or was made aware of this quite recently. This carries on from the, the, the car leasing comment you made, Emma, uh, bringing it down a scale, mobile phones. Mm. Uh, now, the, a mobile phone uh, has an inbuilt life of 12 years. But in the UK, uh, people tend to, to retain a mobile phone for no more than about 18 months before they upgrade it. And I was trying to work out why that is the case, because my, I've, I've 
I have actually recently updated my iPhone, but the one I had before that was like eons old. People used to laugh at me and say it runs on Steam, but it worked. It did everything I wanted it to do. And it dawned on me that the UK is one of the few countries in the world where you, you, you go and look for a mobile phone contract. And when you sign up to a contract, you get a phone. Many other countries, you go and buy a phone uh, and then you find a contract. And consequently, there's the perceived value in the item doesn't exist amongst many people. If, if you was to go into a, a, an Apple store and buy the a, a top level iPhone, uh, just as, as a piece of equipment on its own, you'd be paying what, yeah. $200, $2,000? Um, now, if you went out and bought a, a camera for $1,500, $2,000, you would protect it and look after it and put it in a case and, and, and cherish it. But because you haven't had that kind of financial interaction between the, 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 the product, if you drop it, you drop it. If it breaks, it breaks. You'll just get a new one. You're going to upgrade it next year anyway. And this is why we have this mount, these mountains of phones and, and other electrical equipment as well. So maybe there, there needs to be a, a, a fresh way of looking at how we we um, buy stuff and how, how do we actually, you know, what, what is the financial tracks transaction that, 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 that uh, puts something in our hands um, that, that can somehow sort of reaffirm the value of that item, which then stimulates more respect for that item and more long longevity for it. That's a really interesting point. I always feel like we're, we're heading down the deposit return type, type route, maybe, Stephen. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, Emma deposit returns are, um, you know, being considered in the UK for obviously some small packaging items. Mm. Um, I think Germany was toying with uh, them on electricals. But is, is you know, mm. what sort of financial mechanisms are, are, do you think could, could work in that context? You know, is it... <laughs> Is it the consumer or is it is it the businesses? I mean, if it's <laughs> I mean we, you know, we pass a lot of this on to the consumer, but my personal um, opinion is is that the producer and the brand need to take responsibility for the stuff that they put on the market. Ult yeah, ultimately, they make the profit from the sale. So that's if you want to find excess uh, money to to solve a problem, that's where the money is. It's certainly not in the consumer's pocket for the reason we've you know the reasons we've just explained that consumer may only just be able to afford that phone you know why should they have to then fork out for it at end of life but i think steam's point is really really important we've completely lost the connection the value of things so we don't know the value of all those raw materials and critical raw materials in that phone we have no concept of that at all we just think about the cleverly designed monthly payment which has been designed to not press us too far and feel feel like good value and all that sort of thing. And all of these things have been designed without thought about sustainability. You know, so we have to we have to kind of be really honest about what how, where we're at, you know. It's not good enough now to sort of just slap a sustainability badge on it because actually it's it needs a redesign, really. Um, so you know the mechanisms like deposit return are great but I do feel like they're a bit sticky plaster you know it's it's kind of just dealing with all this stuff and oh, how do we get it back but I do think they do raise awareness of there is value in this put it back you know it's a thing with value like Stephen was saying you know a thousand pound phone you ought to be out you ought to be thinking this is a thing worth a lot of money um, and at the moment we're not um, so sorry roundabout way of saying any mechanism I think that shows consumers that there's value in stuff we need to reinforce that and use that um we are after all throw away throw away society it's called that for a reason true and looking at the, the chat that i've just seen like the yes, message right. like, all the time you guys have been you've been talking i'm like going, yeah yeah absolutely it's generally the audience is saying as well so there's a lot of agreement out here comment that i just want to reflect on and, and come bring in what you're just saying and, and, and jen i'm going to come to you first for an answer on this one was um so james hall messaging hi james thanks for your message um saying that he's look he tries to look at the uh understanding the raw material and the energy impact of the products that he's making of 
products that he's going to buy. Obviously, that's not something day to day consumers are necessarily going to be able to go out and find all that information on their fingertips. But that comes back to labeling, which often comes up. Um, and I know it's you know something you've talked about a number of times is about labeling. How what role do we think that has to play? Is is that is that enough? Is how, how does that factor into this this debate? Um, I remember I interviewed um, Tara Button, who founded Buy Me Once, which is a website, you know, where it's they sort of curate everything that's on there for repairability and durability and longevity and things like that. And Tara talked about wanting to introduce this idea of um, cost per use labelling, especially on things like white goods, um, you know, because sometimes but it becomes difficult doesn't it because I understand that you know if your washing machine breaks and you've only got 200 quid doesn't matter how many costs per use you're going to get out of it you just want a washing machine but I think in the same way that we're now look, talking about carbon footprinting labeling on foods and things like that it would be really useful to have some because I think a lot of the time people want to make a better decision but they just don't have the information there and um, so if it whether it was carbon footprint labeling whether it was a um, I don't know, like a, a traffic light thing for whether it's got, uh, you know, conflict minerals in or something like that, because we don't talk about this stuff. And when you see um, Stacey Dooley did a great documentary a few years ago about fast fashion and sort of had all these things of water, I think, st stacked up saying this is how much water goes into a pair of jeans. We, why would we know that? We don't know that until somebody tells us it and then we can make a different decision. So, um, yeah, I think potentially as long as the labelling was... I mean, Stephen will probably have lots of information on this as to whether the sort of traffic light schemes on food and things help actually help people make better choices or whether people just look at them and ignore them and feel, oh, that's red or feel a bit bad about that. But I'm just not going to re reduce the amount I, I um, consume of it. I don't know. But uh, personally, I feel like more information delivered in an accessible, consumable way can only be helpful. Absolutely. Steve, over to you. Sorry, so I, yeah, I, I, I agree. I have a love-hate relationship with with labelling. Um, uh, the, the the labels you mentioned on in, in on, on food packaging uh, that, that indicate their recyclability is a very well-intentioned uh, approach, but but I've come across much evidence where it's actually made things worse because if you're going to provide that level of, of of information, it needs to be absolutely simple and it needs to be the same everywhere. And so the one I always like or hate, I should say, is the, is the, the, the wording on a uh, label that says this packaging is widely recyclable. Check your local recycling website for, for information. Now, go through the thought processes. You're preparing your evening meal. You, you've, you've used the contents of the pack. Do I put this in the recycling bin? Oh, hang on. I'll just go and check on the, the council's website. No one is going to do that. It's either recyclable or it's not there's no middle ground there's no amber and i think that the labeling and information is is great but it has to be very very abrupt it needs to be simple it needs to be yes this is sustainable no it isn't and in order for that to be delivered in a in a, a transparent way there has that has to be supported with the regulations and the the, the evidence that, that that determines something as being sustainable or not so i, I love labeling but it has that it's it's not just about a, a sort of a, a traffic light system. It needs to have some kind of robust legislation that, that supports the determination of what something is. And Steve, actually, you've you've segued us lovely into another question from the audience. So thank you for that. Um, so obviously, France at the beginning of the year banned plastic packaging on uh, fruit and veg. Uh, is is that sort of really hardcore black and white legislation? Part, part of this process? What role does it have to play? Well, it's vital. I mean, as I said, as I said earlier, the, the behaviour change hierarchy places the removal of the opportunity to behave contrary to, to requirement as the most effective. If you remove the option for someone to be unsustainable, then you've solved an awful lot of the problem. If you can't do that, you make the, the preferred behaviour the easiest because as a species, we do like to take things very, make life very easy for ourselves. So what you do is you make following an unsustainable choice, the more difficult one. And at the moment, it's actually more difficult. It requires a little bit more effort to be sustainable. So that needs to swap around. And as you go down, you make the, the, the preferred behavior the, the cheapest or the most financially viable. Uh, and each one of those layers, each, each of that level, uh, delivers an a, a incrementally less effective behaviour change. But nonetheless, 
um, they're on there and, and banning plastic bags, plastic packaging, that is a really good start. That's a really, really good, powerful way um, the, to start that process. And Steve, thank you for answering two questions in one then, because I also had a question asking for more information on your behavioural hierarchy. So thank you for that. <laughs> and there seems to be a lot of interest in that too. So okay. two for one there. Um, I, Jen, I'm going to come to you. A few comments coming in around, obviously we're talking about marketing a lot so far about, you know, the power of marketing and how it's influencing our behaviour uh, and obviously the decisions that we're making. How how do we get and influence the, the marketeers? How do they, what role have they got to play in all of this? How can we influence them or how do they influence our buying behaviours? Uh, how do we, let's, let's go with we, how do we influence them or can we influence them? What's going what's gonna to tick their boxes? Um, I mean, I, I, thinking about our power, I guess, as consumers. So, you know, when we when we don't buy something, it doesn't really feel like we're sending much of a message. But, you know, we are um, and we can amplify that message by then. Um, uh, sharing that we've done that you know like a, Stephen was saying about the phone you know so you could just put on your on your social media god Apple have you know been hounding me about this upgrade my phone's working perfectly well I've decided I'm going to challenge myself to see how long I can keep using it for and that just gently nudges people to think actually I don't just because Apple tells me I have to upgrade or I can upgrade doesn't mean I have to but then also remembering that you know we get to use our voices as well with these manufacturers and these retailers um, and we can do that um in a gentle or non-gentle way, however we choose to. But, um, you know, that is one of the, the great things about social media is that if, especially if we do it via something like social media, they are kind of, um, in a lot of cases, need to be seen to be replying to this kind of thing. Um, so I think there was a cat that, I think, didn't John Lewis do something really weird earlier? They brought out a, an essentials range or something towards the end of last year and started trying to compete with a lot of the sort of fast fashion brands. And I saw it come up and I and I sort of, you know, um, replied to them on Twitter, said, I'm really disappointed to see this. Can you, you know, you have these um, ideas about being a sustainable company and things. And I got a very stock kind of answer in reply to it and sort of followed up with it again and, um, and then never heard anything. But, you know, what I should have done is been more persistent and sort of kept on at them until I got an answer that that wasn't just sort of a greenwashy answer. But um, absolutely, you know, we need to... Um, be holding businesses to account in just our own small way and also to be um congratulating and endorsing products you know that, that we feel like do tick our boxes or you know behaviors that we are really proud of that, that are sort of um helping us to consume less fab and i think i think thank you jen and i think the uh, other questions are coming around covid19 and have we obviously that started that seems to have accelerated a lot of conversations with around the environment around our impact on both you know uh, on on the world both locally and globally and are we are we seeing are we seeing that accelerate action is that actually moving into um into us making different decisions emma is that is that something that you're ex experiencing or seen any evidence of I kind of had high hopes it might, but I don't think it will. <laughs> um, the cynic in me, because I think we're on a trajectory and, you know, we, the, you know, the economies of the world, as Stephen said, are based on a, an aspiration and expectation that you have, you know, a, a more, um, you know, more profitable economy if you consume stuff, you know, and that's, that's a post-war kind of ideology. That's where it all started. Um, so, you know, not every country is like that. So it's cultural. You know, other some countries value other things more important, more importantly that and know that they can make revenue in other ways. So I completely agree with Stephen. We have to shift. We can't kind of go, oh, we've had our cake, but you can't have any. Um, which is frankly what we do about a lot of things, you know, say, well, we've done all that industrial revolution stuff. You guys have all got to sit still now and do, you know, cut, cut all your uh, carbon emissions. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's... It's a difficult one with COVID. I think what was, you know, what if anything good came out of COVID, people stopped and they had time to think. And what has that shown us? That when you have time to think, you start to value your family more and you start to value green spaces and you start to value your health. And then when it all starts speeding up again, those things go out the window and you go back to normal. So it's more convenient for um, an economy based on consumption to have us all running around frantically, basically, you know, um, because, you know, that's when we think we need all this stuff. So, you know, if 
if it's had any effect, I think people have found a bit of their voice maybe a bit more because, you know, there was a bit more community spirited and people were a bit more kind of, um, you know, getting out and sort of talking about things. Um, but I, you know, I don't have high hopes that it's going to last. I don't, I think there'll be a tiny little blip um, and, then, and then we'll all go back, back to normal. I think we've got bigger, uh, you know, we've got bigger challenges really to, to turn this particular problem around. And didn't Amazon's profits go up by twenty percent or something during well, the sure, pandemic? Sat at home, yeah. Because every, you know, and so and so that, um, you know, for those people who maybe were the the resistant ones to doing online shopping, like my my parents, you know, would have always been quite resistant to online shopping, wouldn't have quite trusted it, and I guess maybe they're then sort of forced into doing this and it's like oh that's okay um you know and and so there was probably that demographic that got on board but also it just you know that has become very much the norm for people and immediately they need or want something it's just the amazon app is there and it's just you know so so you know even the whereas pre-covid they might have gone to the shops or might have looked on a different website and now it's just that's just the habit it is a you know a, a habit of where to shop and and so so convenient mm -hmm. Worth pointing out that COVID did have the effect of increasing glass and uh, beverage can consumptions in a certain part of Westminster. Uh, well. <laughs> I think uh, the, the COVID thing, from what I've seen, I think it was it, it's frustrating um, in that nature uh, gave us an opportunity of a reset. Uh, I don't think anyone would, would have welcomed COVID, but it, it arrived. We, we, we had to suffer it. Uh, but from the lens of today, looking back, it was a great opportunity. It was a great reset. You know, it allowed society at a global level to stand back and think, right, whilst we're dealing with COVID, is there a better way we can be doing things? Can we use this opportunity to kind of reset things? That's not really happened. And I think that in history will dictate or show that that was a regretful um, omission, I, I think. it's, uh, And it has had um, some impacts in terms of waste generation, which has highlighted consumer uh, trends. I work, I'm working with a, a UK local authority at the moment that has seen glass uh, consumption increase by 60% uh, over the last two years. And this particular local authority does not collect glass from the curbside. And people have to take it to a glass recycling bank instead. And despite that, prior to COVID, they had very, very high levels of uh, capture rates. But glass consumption has gone through the roof. And it's that additional consumption, that additional amount of product that isn't being recycled. And so people who, I, mean, I can't get my head around that, actually. What if people are already recycling using the glass banks? Why wouldn't they take their extra couple of bottles or? jars to, to the recycling bank. So there's these strange anomalies uh, that have arisen that, that I think will take us a little while to, to get ahead around. That's interesting. It's the inconsistencies of behaviour. <laughs> um, and, and Steve, I'm just going to give you a follow up question to, to the answer you've just given as well. So um, in terms of obviously at the moment, one of the other uh, phrases that have come up quite a lot over the last kind of 12, 18 months is the fact that we're in a climate emergency. And obviously that in itself also has created uh, a lot of feelings around uh, eco anxiety and climate anxiety as well. Is there is there ways that this is is a useful tool to encourage behaviour change or is it actually having the opposite effect? How do we best use those uh, to get good outcomes? My, my theory, and it's a working hypothesis, open to debate, um, I, I don't think it helps. Um, what, does, what is a climate emergency? How do we define that? How does, you know, we, what, what does it mean? Is, is suddenly the, the, the climate going to completely change tomorrow, next year? That There's no metrics. It's, it's a completely abstract term. So such a point where I think there's uh, a, a large group of society, particularly younger people, it has to be said, that are very, very worried but don't know what to do. And everybody else that thinks it's too big a problem for them to, to, to worry about at an individual level. And I think there is a danger that that kind of language, uh, whilst I understand why it's being used, and I wouldn't say it's necessarily inappropriate in terms of the impact that it's trying to deliver, it, it, it's doing it in a very clumsy way. It's not, it needs more nuance. It, we, we can't create this idea. I've always said that, that leading a sustainable life isn't about stopping doing the things you wanted to do, you like doing. It's just about doing them in a different way. 
car, cars, classic example, for years and years, uh, the motoring fraternity car people, of which I am one, I have to be, I have to, to be honest about this, I love cars, motoring. The idea of going to electric was an anathema. Oh, that's for the, for the lentil eaters, that's for the, uh, the, the people who wear sandals. But if you look now, the, the, the car industry, is EV cars that are coming out, a Porsche Taycan is a desirable car. It's fully electric. It's perhaps debate. We can discuss the sustainability of it. But what we're seeing is that kind of normalization, people embracing it positively. And I think that's where we're getting to. So I think the, 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 the hard messages, the shocking messages, we need to, to consider how they're being delivered. I'm not saying ignore them because we can't, but how we're delivering in them and the language that we're using needs a little bit more care, I think. That's an interesting point. Jen, obviously you're you're talking to a whole range of different members of the public. How how is that influencing, you know, the, the kind of all the climate emergency and you know the resulting care anxiety that comes? How's that influencing what they're doing? I think it's one of the things that we are still aren't really discussing very well is how consumption contributes to the climate emergency. Um, so, you know, we, we all like, you know, Stephen's saying about um, greener energy and things like that, but um, certainly from, you know, government levels, we're not hearing anything about, I don't think you would hear a government say, right, can you all just buy a little bit less? Do you know, that's just um, kind of not happening. And so I think there is definitely you know, and I found this before we did that year buying nothing new. I just hadn't joined the dots at all. It just hadn't occurred to me that what I was buying needed energy to produce it, needed raw um, raw materials. That there were, you know, if you'd asked me before that about, you know, well, who do you think, how do you think your t-shirts are made? I would have just said in a factory, and I just assumed it was all automated. You know, didn't realize that there was, you know, a woman sat there sewing the same seam day in day out for eighteen hours a day or anything like that. And 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 then obviously, you know, I didn't give any thought at all. To what happened when I to something when I was done with it and you know maybe and I don't know how we encourage people to join those dots and I think that's you know this time around buying nothing new I've sort of um invited people to join in with me and the whole point isn't to bash people over the head if they buy something new it's to to encourage people to to think about what they're buying because we don't we don't think about where it's come from who's made it where it's going to go when we've done it because we're busy people maybe um, you know, whisper, manufacturers and retailers don't want us to ask those questions, Do you know, maybe that's that's part of it. Um, but yeah, it's it's um, not something that we talk about enough, I don't think, again, because it's just um, not something that we aspire to. It's not something probably that governments want us to aspire to in terms of the economy and things like that. You know, and then you're always asked this question. I get asked it quite a lot. Well, what happens to the economy? If everybody stopped buying new things, what would happen to the economy? Well, A, I don't think everybody's going to stop buying new things, but B, we need to create a different economy. We need, to, we cannot have this idea of infinite growth on a finite planet like we there is no that you know there is no economy on a dead planet we need to create a different I'm not saying that the solution is everybody buying nothing new but we certainly need to think about something else and actually Jen that segues perfectly into a question I was going to ask Emma as well which is is exactly that and how we transition the economy and um question that's been sent in by uh, Andy Reese, which I'm going to read word for word because he's, it's it's so well written is how can businesses sell happiness and make money in a way that doesn't involve selling so much stuff I saw that question come in I thought it was great <laughs> one of the things we did realize in Covid during Covid was what make us made us happy I think you know no one said oh, I've had the best week ever because I've just stuffed my house full of stuff from Amazon. You know, we keep saying Amazon. Other, in, other internet uh, sellers do exist. Um, everyone said, do you know what? My neighbour came round and, you know, waved at me over the fence and oh, I got my other neighbour to mend my, you know, my, my shirt's got a hole in it or whatever, you know. And people shared these stories of suddenly working as a community. You know, and I've, massive, I've noticed it massively in my own community in terms of Facebook marketplace and people going, oh, I've put this out if you want it and come and help yourself, and, you know, social distancing and all that stuff. Um, so that camaraderie and how we work together, I think, is, is something that communities can rebuild. OK, it needs a bit of work. It needs great people to facilitate or to kick things off and go, it's OK. You can come and help at the repair cafe. It's not weirdy beardy, you know, and, and 
and, and have fun and remember what it's like to volunteer and all that stuff. Andy's question is really interesting. How do you make money out of that? Right, but why, well, why do we need to make money out of everything? So, you know, this is some big, big questions. Um, and if you look at different economic models, and the Donut Economics book is a brilliant place to start, because she starts by basically saying, you know, all the stuff we've been taught is just our model, right? It's just a model that we constructed. Therefore, we are intelligent beings. We can send people to space and all the rest of it. We can construct another model, you know? Um, so, yeah, it's a really big, big problem. And I think, you know, go back to Jen's point about why the government don't say, well, you should consume a little bit less. You know, resources were hardly talked about at COP. I mean, resources as in resources and waste. Um, and I know, you know, people were quite vocal about that to the government, but it is about 45% of our carbon footprint. And I think, you know, the MacArthur Foundation have done some work on this. We can do lots and lots of work on energy and transport, but we're not going to get to net zero without looking at consumption. It's a bit of an elephant in the room, that one. So sorry to go back to your question, Andy. How can businesses sell happiness? There are some really nice examples of companies now who are selling lifelong products, products with repair built in, um, you know, long warranty. Doesn't matter how old it is, send us it back. You know, Vivo Barefoot is one. I think Patagonia are doing it. I know Angle Poise are doing lifelong lamps, you know, and they're selling legacy and kind of in um, kind of the idea that you would hand something on. So going back to Stephen's, you know, two thousand pound camera. So you buy an Angle Poise lamp today. Or if I bought one today, I could give it to my son if he went to in college or in first flat or whatever, and he could give it to his children. You know, that's that's a that's a new model, and to, that makes me feel happy. So they're still selling me a product. But they're, you know, maybe selling me happiness built in. But then I guess, sorry, just to come in on that, the, the issue is if you are if you are a lower income household, you can't afford that angle poise, the Vivo Barefoot, the Patagonia. You you know, you are looking at H and M, Primark, um, B and M home stores to to buy your things, and that's where you know things will only last for a year and that sort of thing. And so, I don't I don't quite know how we manage Close that. the gap between yeah, the luxury yeah, yeah. Items being you know it's like the watch the philip petite watch that you know you never own you just look after it or something that's their strap line um you know you just hand it on to the next generation but people used to do that with their furniture and their you know mm. heirlooms, and it wasn't ex necessarily expensive stuff so we've got a market flooded with cheap you know um items and materials and um who knows, you know, who knows what's coming with supply chain pressures and that sort of thing. It might make people start to think, you know, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll keep, you know, try and buy something to keep for a bit longer. Are you suggesting my children won't appreciate the Billy bookcase I've left them in my room? <laughs> well, I've got I've got 12 year old Ikea wardrobes. They're going just fine. So, you know, my kids will be getting them. <laughs> And that's a fabulous place to draw us to a close. I'm conscious that we are almost at four o'clock. So as much as oh. I've got, I've got uh, guys, I think we could go on for another hour. There are so many questions, so many comments going in. Audience, you have been wonderful. To finish off though, I'm just going to ask each of the panel to uh, to give their kind of t key takeaway, key message they're either taking or they want to share with the audience to kind of sum up uh, what's been a really diverse conversation. It's certainly got got me thinking about uh you know what comes next how else do we continue this conversation around consumption because it's there and it may well be the elephant in the room alongside our economic models but it's definitely something that needs discussion far far more so um i'm going to start with start with steve what's your what's your takeaway message steve uh i think we're we're, we're seeing as i said at the beginning the start of, of wholesale sustainability i think that needs to be supported by government uh it needs to be sustainability needs to be uh normalized uh, we need to uh, encourage uh, the public to demand it and the, the, the providers uh, to provide it. Uh, but I think we have all of the, the components in place already moving. Uh, the, the momentum has already started. And I think we within our respective sectors uh, play a, a really important part in making that momentum uh, or maintaining that momentum going forwards. Thank you, Steve. Jen. Um, I guess I would say to sort of really recognise and appreciate the role that we have as individuals, as either consumers or as uh, slower, more mindful, more thoughtful consumers, and in how we can 
we can slow down our own consumption, but the different ways that we can then nudge or influence or impact, whether that's, you know, friends, family, colleagues, or even thinking about the, you know, um, your role as sort of within the organisation that you work with and any messaging that you can be putting out there that, that might change business models and things like that. But, you know, we are really powerful and it's not just a chase of us individually buying or not buying something. It's all those people we can influence as well. Thank you, Jen. And over to you, Emma. I'm going to um, stick with the happiness five um, that, that came in as the question. And I think um, we all had the opportunity to stop during COVID. And I, and I would just say to people, if, if you can stop and think about what makes you happy, and it's, it's really unlikely to be that next thing, you know, um, it, it might be that you, you want to buy something, but it will be the social interaction you're going to have wearing that item that's important to you. Um, you know, and it might be that you can have just as nice a time wearing something that's already in, in your wardrobe. So I think that sort of stop and think and just question. You know, I quite often stand in the supermarket and I look around and I'm like, this is mad. You know, when you really stop and look at it, it's like a sweet shop. You know, there's all these messages and stuff. And I think once you kind of take the blank the blinkers off a bit and just question, why am I being pushed all this stuff? You do start to pull back a bit and go, you know what? I, I don't I don't really need all that. I'll just buy what I need, thanks. Um, so yeah, I've just encouraged people to kind of try and think. And as Jen said, have a voice because it really does work. I've seen some real changes in companies that have had, you know, peer, uh, consumer pressure. It really does work. Fantastic. What a wonderful way to end. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's be the change, everybody. Um, so thank you so much to uh, to the panelists. You guys have been amazing. Like I say, we could go on probably for at least another hour with all the uh, with all the questions and comments that have been coming in. Thank you so much, audience, for being so, uh, so interactive and sharing so many great thoughts, ideas, questions and comments as we go. Uh, obviously, everyone can see them. We will let uh, we will uh, make sure everybody uh, can see everything that you have shared with us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a fantastic hour. I apologise we're a couple of minutes over, but uh, Sweater, I'll pass back to you. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks a lot, uh, Jen, Emma and Stephen. I think I mean, like uh, Sarah mentioned, this was a terrific webinar. We had a super engaged audience. So thanks a lot to the audience. And I think a few of you had questions about access to the recording. Since you've signed up for the webinar, you will have access to the recording via Zoom. And in another couple of weeks, the webinar will go up on our YouTube, on the Be Waste Wise YouTube channel, as well as the website. So please sign up to our newsletter to be alerted about it when it goes up. And uh, just a reminder to the audience, we have another webinar happening the day after tomorrow. So if you haven't registered for it, it's going to be moderated by Adam Reed. So please go to our website and register for that one as well. Thanks a lot to all of you. Have a good day or a good evening wherever you're at. Bye-bye.